All right, so raise your hand if you've flooded. If you've ever flooded, your basement's ever flooded. All right. All right, put your hands down. If you haven't flooded, have you at least seen Bezlo's Is There Sewage in the Chicago River.com? All right, most of you have. Um, does it seem like there's, there's more of these one every 20 year, five, 20 year, 25 year, 100 year storm? The, 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 the Wilmette flooding lady says yes. If it seems like there's more, like these things are happening more than once every 100 years or once every 25 years or whatever, it's because they are. Uh, storms today are a lot different than storms were, say, 100 years ago, right? Because of the impacts of climate change. Because of the effects of climate change, storms are more hyper-localized, they're more intense, uh, they're shorter in duration, they're, so there's more water in a shorter period of time, they're less predictable, and that's one of the things that leads to urban flooding. Oh yeah, and there's 12% more record-breaking storms that occurred in, uh, from 81 to 2010 uh, than there would have been without human intervention. Now, our infrastructure in the city, though the sewer system in Chicago is actually very well kept up, and they put about $50 million a year into green elements around it, it was built in a time when we didn't broadly know about climate change. We didn't know about climate change in 1850, 1889, 1892, 1900, etc. And Again, even though we have a pretty modern sewer system, there are still some elements of the sewer system that are in place from when it was originally designed. In fact, there's some places where you can still find um, wooden sewers, right? You can still find elements that look like this. And uh, one, other, one other piece I should mention to this is the city is bigger than it was 100 years ago or 150 years ago, right? And when you expand, what do you do? You're removing green space, which would normally um, take in water and bring it down uh, and draw it down into the groundwater. And what are you replacing it with? Asphalt, right. So when you replace it with asphalt, what's asphalt? Asphalt's nothing more than like a man-made river, right? Raindrops form. They hit the asphalt, the asphalt, they're channeled into the sewer. You might actually say that it's not, uh, it's not the rain's fault and it's not the sewer's fault, it's the asphalt. <laughs> I thought about that. <laughs> I thought about that in the bathroom. Um, okay. I could do this whether you're here or not, so you're here. So what, what is that? So the, so the combination of the fact that you have less green space, you have a sewer system that was built 100 years ago, what does that lead to? Well, it leads to urban flooding. What does urban flooding lead to? Well, for one thing, it leads to situations like this where you're gumming up the works of um, the city's transit, and, of course, it leads to situations like this where you have a flooded basement. That is not my basement. I would not have a basketball down there. Um, and it's costly. It's extremely costly. It, over the last five years, there have been $773 million worth of stormwater damage done in the city alone, and uh, about 181,000 claims of property damage. So it, it's a significant problem. So enter City Digital. Let me explain to you who City Digital is. There is a group here in Chicago called UI Labs. UI Labs stands for University Plus Industry Labs. And they are a consortium building organization. So if there are projects that are too big for any one company or any one company plus a university or whatever to do, these folks are great at building consortia. One of the consortium is City Digital. City Digital is a public-private partnership. It includes the city, industry players, and university players that focus on using the city itself as a test bed for experiments at scale around water, energy, transportation, and physical infrastructure. So City Digital, um, as it relates to the project we're going to talk about tonight, includes um, Microsoft, Accenture, AECOM, uh, ComEd, and a number of university part, uh, partners in here. In this case, it was UIUC, UIUC <clears throat> excuse me. Um, but other universities also play in it as well. UIC and IIT have been partners. And what we're doing here, and what Dana's going to explain to you, 
is we are going to use, we have been using the city itself to test out and experiment with a variety of green solutions to flooding that we're going to use to augment the built infrastructure. So basically what we're kind of thinking of doing is how do you put back some of that green space? How do you put back some of those natural processes to divert water from the sewers and to put it back into the natural system? So we have a variety of green solutions um, and advanced analytics applied to data which are collected from sensors in these uh, green infrastructure sites. So we have things like replacing asphalt with something that's permeable and then putting a package of sensors down there that will understand how much water you're being, that is being diverted. You have things like infiltration planters and infiltration bump outs and bioswales where a bioswale is where you have a sloped, um, uh, a sloped landscape and at the bottom you have native plants that again draw the water back in. So you have all these green elements but what we don't have is good data that talks about the performance and talks about what's good and where, et cetera. Oh, and at City of Digital, I should also mention, um, we we're also helped on this project by uh, our good friends at Glasswater who are uh, scattered around the room. So to talk about the actual experiment and what we found from it, I'm gonna bring up my colleague, Dana El Khadi. Thank you. So as Adam mentioned, the, we're going to be talking about some green infrastructure today. So the objective of this project was really to look at green infrastructure and, and kind of be able to tell, is it doing what we expect it to do? Is it doing what we want it to do? And can we be able to tell how this green infrastructure is functioning in a real time and then be able to modify and, and correct and adjust um, the green infrastructure as needed based on that information that we're receiving? So in order to do that, um, sensors were installed across four different green infrastructure types in the city. So the four types that we're looking at were a bioswale, permeable pavement, infiltration planters, and tree grapes. And um, four sites around the city of Chicago were identified for that. Um, and then some of you may or may not have seen these big orange boxes on Argyle. So that was part of the sensor deployment. So essentially sensors were deployed at these green infrastructure sites and data is streamed from those sensors so that you can collect information about um, soil moisture saturation, uh, precipitation, temperature, so you can kind of correlate the performance of your GI site with what's happening in the, in the world at the time in terms of weather, um, and then use that to make decisions. But four sites were identified in the city of Chicago. So one of them is West Argyle Street, which is between North Broadway and Sheridan, and at that site, permeable pavers and infiltration planters were used. There's also a bioswale at the UI Labs headquarters, which is in Goose Island. Um, and then porous asphalt was implemented at the South Langley Avenue site. And then in South Cottage Grove between 77th and 79th Street, there were infiltration bump outs, um, infiltration planters, and permeable pavers that were used. So currently, we have data streaming from both the West Argyle site and the UI Labs site. Um, and then from the West Argyle site, the West Argyle site, the data is streaming from the infiltration planter, and soon will be streaming from the permeable pavers. So these are photos that kind of show what it looks like to implement a sensor at one of these sites. Um, so it involves, uh, you can see the sensor implementation here and then these homemade boxes that contain um, some of the sensor equipment that are locked up and then placed near the site. So what happens once we get the sensors in the ground and we're trying to collect this information, um, Opti helped us in order to stream this data to a platform that you can access and, and connect to over 20,000 data streams. So you're blending that with external data sets, with live local data, and you're able to kind of put together this dashboard that shows you what's really occurring. So currently we have data streaming from the UI Lab site as well as from the Argyle site, as I mentioned. Um, and currently, I believe they said that the data is set to go live on Thursday um, so that people can, can access it. Uh, we're also kind of working with a limited data set at the moment because of early challenges with getting sensors online and offline. Um, so we're going to continue to monitor data over an extended period of time throughout the coming year in order to have a more comprehensive data set that covers um, a wide variety of weather events, including significant rainfall. So what are the implications of working with data like this? So the goal of, uh, of UI Labs ultimately is beyond this pilot project, and it's kind of why everyone is here today, which is to look at how we can integrate um, solutions 
to solve real world problems. So what we're noticing or what we're trying to advocate here is that you, know, you can integrate physical hardware and digital platforms in order to provide the ability to deploy and test smart solutions to improve water planning, decision making, and ultimately better respond to these emerging water challenges that Adam touched on earlier. So some of the things that we're noticing are that cities, utilities, and many other organizations are looking at smart technology and practices to solve their water solutions. So when you have a pilot project like this, you have live data that's streaming, you can get um, hyper-local information in order to um, improve decision making. You can look at things like connecting flood sensors to enhance disaster management response and improve it. You can look at integrating data into urban resilience data sets so that it's accessible and used to enhance decision making. Um, you can develop smart utility strategies that develop specific goals based on data that you've seen. Um, you can even develop apps and software systems that connect people like us to uh, community data and water infrastructure opportunities on a consistent basis. And New York's a city that's kind of begun to do that in terms of connecting data with people and then um, opportunities for project work. So to talk more about our information and data, I will pass it off to Tom Schenk. Very well, thank you. So I'm here, which means somebody said the word data. Uh, I'm the chief data officer for the city of Chicago. Now I'm going to want to walk through a little bit about how we're trying to take this project and turn it into an open data project. You heard about the context of this, about uh, sustainability, about green infrastructure, about returning our 5,000 miles of streets back from being a man-made river back to, back to nature. So how can we do this? Now what's really important around science, we all know this, what's really important about science, what makes it survive is openness around science, that others can get access to the numbers, others can get access to the data, so we can all explore. We can explore the questions that were posed to us today about does this really capture soil moisture, how much soil uh, moisture are we capturing through these uh, little green parkways now that we have on the side of the streets. But there's other questions that you might ask. So this data, the data that's driving these, these, these Internet of Things that basically are now embedded into the streets, we're publishing onto the open data portal. And that's why I have here behind me. I'm going to show you just some raw data first, because everybody loves raw data, and we'll get into some graphs uh, and, and take a look at this. Now, there's a variety of different sensors that you, you're going to see listed out. You're going to have rainfall and air temperature on the Argyle uh, uh, sensors on the north side, uh, wind pressure, wind speed. Uh, sorry, barometric pressure, wind speed. And then we have sensors at the Langley station as well, such as air temperature, rainfall, again, pressure, wind speed, uh, and, and a variety of different things. So we have this data now starting to populate in the open data portal. Now I'm going to have to pause and say something that's kind of weird. It's not public yet. We have to make a tweak to be able to handle the large volume of data that we're expected to see over the next couple of years. And that tweak is going to change the URL. So we're waiting a couple days because we have to make one change and then it will be public and live. And this data is going to be streaming hourly. And currently, that's what it's doing right now behind the scenes. Uh, on the half hour, every single hour, the data is being updated. So let's just take a very, very brief look uh, behind some of the data. Now, uh, for those who have not, those who are new, uh, Derek, I'm not sure if you did, who's new here? Not, no. oh, not yet. Yeah, so who's new here? All right, who's never seen the open data portal? All right, all right, good. So data.cityofchicago.org, that's the website that you'll go to and you'll see this sort of data. Now this data is temperature over a period of time. Uh, it's on this little timeline series graph here. So we can zoom into different time periods. And a measurement value of 10, 10 degrees Celsius. Let's take a look at a little bit more interesting of a graph, something that's a bit more relevant. So what we're taking a look at here is various different metrics. This is actually a big, uh, big hodgepodge of a lot of stuff. Um, pressure, rainfall, uh, uh, again, more uh, wind direction, wind speed, uh, the soil moisture that's being measured. So now you're going to be able to take a look at this over a long period of time. What are the ebbs and flows? What are the ups and downs? You're going to see information such as what is the rainfall right now? And then shortly thereafter, hopefully, you're going to see an uptick in the amount of moisture that's being captured through these sensors, through these 
piece of, again, a little parkway. So you're going to be able to have access to that. Again, it's going to be streaming. It's going to be available every single hour, which you can use to answer the questions that were phrased here today. You might be able to answer, ask your own questions and, and have those answered as well, whether or not you're in university, a student, uh, doing this as, a, uh, uh, as just a, a point of interest. So of course, the city of Chicago, city digital, and all the partners about this are going to be very interested in how you are going to be able to use that. Because it's going to help us drive, what do we want to do next with this? How can we use this sort of data beyond the original scope of questions? And that's something that this community does best. So that's all I have. And as we get this data online, we expect it to be online uh, by Thursday. You'll be able to go and visit it. Again, download that data and connect uh, through the Open Data Portal's APIs. All right, so that's all I have. So once you guys have <laughs> once you guys have finished collecting all your data, like suppose that you find that the permeable papers are cheap and they work great, then what's the next step? Does that become like what Chicago uses to pave everything, or where do you guys go after that initial data collection? So one of the one of the goals behind this pilot is to uh, so you're getting this data from these sites and and you're one of the things that you're going to be able to tell is which GI, which GI types function in different types of rain events better, right? So you might, have, you might find from your data that one type of GI functions better in a, in a strong rain event that's very intense and short, whereas one functions better for a smaller amount of rain over a cons consistent period of time. So what we're doing with this data is a kind of an engineering analysis feedback loop in order to analyze it from that perspective and see what kind of trends we find so we can provide some design recommendations for future GI. Hi, there's a new uh, project that everybody's been reading about, about the new city streetlight project, where they're replacing um, LED street, uh, street lamps and installing them. And part of that infrastructure that they're laying in is a new remote management system where they'll be able to monitor the streetlights. Has there been any discussion about expanding the sensor technology so that you could actually leverage the network they're building to manage the streetlights to get more sensor data and data points? Uh, so each one of those each one of those projects are a little bit different in scope. Uh, with the, with the city streetlights, so the city of Chicago, which has an extraordinary number of streetlights, you can always tell the outline of the city quite perfectly when you fly over it because of the streetlights. Uh, they're being replaced, and we're going to move to a more uh, affordable form of technology that powers those. But really, one of the big focuses on those smart streetlights from the get go is being able to lower their costs and be able to better easy manage those. So, for instance, now when a streetlight goes out. This is not kidding, but this is very pragmatic. When a streetlight goes out, our crews go out, but our crews work during the day. So they take off their yellow vests, they put it over a sensor, and if the streetlight goes on, but one of them does not, great, streetlights are out. This is a pragmatic, otherwise you have your street repairman working all night, and it's, it even adds to the expense. Uh, there are some other sensors that might go into the smart streetlights, uh, but of course we're going to be very careful about you know, not impinging on anybody's property or anybody's privacy because they're going to be everywhere. As opposed to these, which are very, very focused about points of collection that you see of going into the ground, which the smart street lights are not going to be great about because they're going to be on pavement themselves and not on these smart infrastructure. But in general, taking a step back, uh, uh, over the next few years, you're going to see a lot of sensor projects. This project is one of three main sensors projects that the city of Chicago is working on, sustainable uh, green infrastructure monitoring, the array of things which has been talked about quite a bit of measuring, uh, measuring your communities, and then also the Smart Street Lights project, which is going to uh, take in some more information about electricity use and other things that might be happening. And we are keeping in mind about all the data that's being collected and how we can leverage that to optimize our city operations. Uh, so prior to the installation of these uh, sensors, what have been some of the ways that the city has decided how, how and which uh, green infrastructure elements to include in a given project? Um, it's, it's blue. Um, the, uh, I'm certainly not speaking on behalf of the city, but oftentimes I know a lot of the decisions that were being made around green infrastructure were oftentimes done through modeling. Uh, so there's a model of the city sewer itself that can look at overall performance and then you know sort of how to place these things as it comes in. Uh, and then you look at sort of location, capital need, and other things to sort of triangulate what makes sense. Uh, I think what's very interesting about the potential of this technology is to have a feedback loop to that so that if you have some design or engineering assumptions, you can actually test it over a longer period of time and with multiple 
multiple locations at scale. What's the relation between the overall size of the problem and what each individual green infrastructure unit brings and, and how much would need to be built out in order to, like, s I don't know, noticeably reduce the amount of flooding or something along those lines? So, so uh, the question, I think, was what's the, what's the scale of the smart green infrastructure versus the problem of flooding? It's a, it's a component of the solution. Uh, one of the companies that we worked with, in fact, uh, Pavel is here today, is Opti, who looks at not just the green infrastructure elements, but a number of other ways of handling flooding, like um, underneath the large buildings in the city, there are holding tank cisterns, and there's about a, a what is it, about a four inch uh, diameter hole down there that drains it. Well, what if you got smart about um, using data to model out when that hole should expand and when it should contract and when you should release the, the water out and when you shouldn't? So. My point here is that it is just one element of of, of a uh, of a broader study. I would also just add to that that um, you know one of the goals is to kind of identify which types of green infrastructure can have a maximum impact on a certain type of area. So when you look at some of our most flood prone communities or areas in the city, you know like our west side or our south side, then you can kind of start to look at it from that sense. So it might not be an explicit number, but that will help make decision making so you can have a maximal impact. Hey, yeah, um, so quick question about like the individual sites, right? I mean, I think what makes like a Chicago project interesting is you can test Chicago, right? Because uh, obviously this kind of testing has been done other places, but um, is the soil uniform? I mean, can, can you say like a, a rain garden in the north side would perform like a rain garden in the south side, and and certainly if you're looking at sensors, like is are the attributes of, of the locations like available as well for you know that like depth of the bioswale stuff like that. Yeah, so that's a great point. Um, so in terms of when you're doing like an engineering calculation, for example, to see how your GI is performing, a lot of things come into play there, like the porosity of your soil, and you know, is it. Is it functioning well because your soil just has a high porosity level, or is it because of your GI? So all of that comes into play. I'm not sure if we have that information available that will be <coughs> like rolled out with that with the data, but um, that information goes into calculations when you're looking at engineering analysis for sure. Hi. Um, so I'm wondering about like controls. So in the sites that you mentioned, are there like multiple different like places that the sensors are being taken so that you can kind of compare where the intervention's been done and where it hasn't? So the sensors are not, there isn't like a control sensor, right? Because as David mentioned earlier, a lot of this was kind of done in tandem with projects as they were going on. Um, however, you know, you can kind of look at a control versus, it, you can kind of think about it in this way, right? You want to see how your GI is performing during rain events especially. So you can kind of compare it to a dry event and then look at it from that perspective. Uh, so you mentioned a lot about uh, engineering modeling and a lot of the methodology into analyzing this data and comparing against expected performance. Uh, will that methodology and those models uh, be detailed publicly so that the people who are able to pub publicly access the data, are they also able to uh, do the analysis for themselves and make these sort of comparisons? So as I mentioned earlier, we're going to extend the period of data collection and throughout until the through the end of this year so that engineering analysis won't be done until the end of this year likely um, and at that point I'm not sure I mean I can't speak to whether that would be released or not but yeah all right well uh, Adam Dana and Tom thank you very much all right <laughs>